Hi guys, hello everyone, I'm Gavin.js, and one of my favorite things to do in Blender is to make abstract nonsense. And often when I'm looking for inspiration to do that, I turn towards the platonic solids. They're just really satisfying and simple shapes that I think have a lot of potential. You can use them for making crystals, you can make things that look really techy. There's just a lot of things that you can do with them. So I enjoy working with the geometry nodes, and in geometry nodes, there are a couple of platonic solids that you just don't have by default. Of the platonic solids, you can really only use cubes and icosahedrons. So if you want to work procedurally, it can be kind of tedious to get the rest of the solids in there. Especially if you want to test out different solids to see what would look really good. I like to switch between using an icosahedron and a dodecahedron. They have a lot of similarities, and depending on the vibe, I could see either one working really well, so I like to test things. But in order to do that easily, I need things to be fully procedural, and there's no way to do that by default in Blender. Now all of this said, there is a free add-on that comes with Blender called the Math Functions add-on. And honestly, it's really cool. It gives you access to a bunch of different surfaces. It gives you a bunch of different equations that you can use right out of the bat. You can make your own equations to generate just about any surface you want. And it can generate all of the solids, not just the platonic solids, all of the truncations, all of the explosions, all of the rest of them but and this is a big deal in my opinion just like creating anything in blender once you've created it and you click away that's it you've lost the ability to play with any of the basic parameters but you can't just switch them out on the fly also all of the topology is really weird and i can't blame anybody for this like it makes sense and i'm sure for a lot of them there are are reasons for this in fact there are really good reasons for this if you just take a look at the dodecahedron the, your basic dodecahedron it has a quad and a triangle, which traditional wisdom says, that's great. Don't have a pentagon. Don't have anything with any more sides than four. And I agree with this rule. However, depending on what you're doing, you may or may not want to break this. In fact, you may or may not need to break this. A really good example of this is the mechanical jellyfish that I made a while back. For the underplating, I thought it'd be really cool to have some hexagons in there, so I threw in an icosphere. I used a dual node to turn all of the triangles into the hexagons and some pentagons. And then I split all the edges and scaled each face down, right? That was the workflow I literally showed the node graph in the video. But if I had used the math functions add-on, and I had just dropped in a dodecahedron, for whatever reason I wanted maybe fewer faces, that's not the point. If I had done that, I would have had a quad and a triangle, and then when I hit split edges, it would have split those two apart and shrunk them down individually too. It would not have given me nice pentagons, it would not have given me nice hexagons. It would have been incredibly bad, it would not have gone well, I would be very upset, spend way too much time, way too focused on this niche thing trying to find a solution. Point being, sometimes, I want a pentagon. And if you cannot abide by having a pentagon in your project, a, I understand, and B, once you subdivide it once, then you get all quads and everything's good. And that's usually my workflow is to take all of my objects and subdivide them to some level because that just helps out with topology. It helps out with normals. It's just, it's an established workflow. And for that workflow of subdividing everything, the math functions add-on won't help you here. So that's what I'd like to solve today. I'd like to have more options for using platonic solids in my projects in Blender so that we can have all of them easily accessible in geometry nodes and we can switch between them at will for a fully procedural workflow. So with all of that said, let's hop into Blender. All right, so just real quick, this is essentially what we're gonna be aiming for. This is all of the logic that we need to be able to come over here to the modifiers tab, be able to change the solid that we have selected and be able to switch through all of the basic platonic solids. I've got a couple more settings here because this is a little bit more built out than I intend to get to today. I don't plan on using UVs at all today. That'll be a challenge for another day because oh boy, believe you me, it is a challenge. So to get going, let's just hide that object for now and let's create a plane. So if we just jump into edit mode, we can go ahead and select all of our vertices and hit delete. We don't need anything. We just need an empty mesh so that we have something to add some modifiers to. So jumping back up into object mode, let's go over to our modifiers panel and go down to geometry nodes. Let's hit new and bring them up here at the bottom of the screen. And for now, let's just delete our group input. We'll bring it back in a little bit, but for now we don't need it. 
So to get going, we're going to start off with a tetrahedron. And in order to make one of those, I tried a few different methods. And honestly, in geometry nodes with the limited primitives that we have available to us, the easiest way I found was to start with a cone. So let's wire our cone to the output so that we can see what we're doing. And I'm just going to change the number of vertices to three. We'll come back to it in a moment because right now we need to center our centroid. The centroid is the point that's equidistant from all of our vertices, and I like to make sure that the origin is at the same spot. So what we need to do is shift our entire cone down a bit. So let's change our depth from 2 to 1 so that it's only one unit tall. And with a transform geometry node, we can shift it down by 0.5. Now we need a vector math node, and let's change that from add to normalize. And now we need to get the position of all of our vertices. So to do that, let's get a position node, run that into our normalize node, then let's add a set position node so that we can feed our geometry into geometry and our normalized positions into the position. Now this is starting to look really good, but it looks a little too tall to me, and when we pull in the other set of solids that I already made, we can see that it's not quite lining up. And the reason for this is that the base wasn't quite wide enough, so when we normalized everything, the vectors weren't quite facing the right direction, so it didn't get set properly. And I'll save you the Pythagorean theorem and all of the math that I did to find this value. But essentially, in the radius bottom, we need to set it to this value so that everything lines up and all of our points are equidistant from the origin and all of our edges are the same length. So that's looking really good. Let's turn off our other solids so we don't get any Z fighting there. And that's our tetrahedron done. So let me just minimize all of this and clean it up just a little bit because largely we don't need to look at any of that ever again. Let's just add a frame around that, give it a label. Honestly, that was the most complicated one. It's the farthest from anything that we have access to by default in Blender and it takes the most computation. So what we can do is copy our position, normal, and set position nodes, and let's add a cube. Now obviously the cube sounds pretty straightforward because we already have access to that in geometry nodes, but I'm going to go ahead and run it through this normalize function because by default the edge lengths of a cube are set to 1, but not the radius or the distance of each vertex to the origin. So to make sure that everything's standardized for our solids, we're just going to make sure that all of them run through this normalize function and everything will have the same radius. Next, let's make the octahedron, which honestly, all we need to do is just select everything from our cube, hit shift D to duplicate, and we just need to add a dual mesh node right there in the middle. If we wire that to our output, we can see that we get an octahedron. And the reason this works is because it creates the dual of the input, which means that all of the faces become vertices and the vertices become faces. And so if we take a look at our octahedron, that's exactly what we see. We see we have six vertices and we have eight faces, which is the inverse of a cube. Now that I'm looking at the octahedron here, uh, actually what we could do is just take the cube from before and run it into the octahedron and that way we have one fewer nodes. So why don't we do that? So now to make our dodecahedron, what we're going to do is select everything from the octahedron, hit shift D to duplicate all of that, and now we're going to add an icosphere. And if we run that into our dual mesh, and what we see is, yeah, we've got our dodecahedron, and that's because the dodecahedron is the dual of the icosphere. So it runs by the exact same logic as our octahedron. And by the same logic, in fact, we can just run our icosphere into our output and we've got the last platonic solid. And this looks a little silly and I hate it, but also we don't need any additional logic. That's, that's it. Now, it will be important that I label this here in a moment because we have a few more steps before we're done, but those are our five platonic solids. And I know that may seem a little silly to have gone through all of that work to make those when they're fairly straightforward. But once we have the ability to switch between them, it'll be really nice for any procedural workflows where you're not really sure which solid you want to use and you can just switch it at any time. But of course, speaking of proceduralism, this is not terribly procedural to have to wire this in manually one at a time to be able to switch between our solids. So let's set up a little bit more logic to be able to switch from our modifier tab. 
So let's start by adding an integer and let's leave that at zero and add that to our tetrahedron. Now we'll also need a store named attribute node and let's change this from float to integer. So now we can feed in our geometry along with our integer. And so now we have a value we can use to distinguish the tetrahedron from all of the rest of our geometry. So let's give this attribute a name because we need one to be able to search through later. I'm going to use selection. And let's add that to our tetrahedron group now. And then just duplicate this logic for the rest of them, incrementing our integer for each solid. And now with all of that data encoded, let's add a join geometry node and we can merge all of our solids together. Of course, we have all of that data encoded and we have all of the geometry made, but if we just merge it together, we get something kind of ridiculous. So now we need a delete geometry node, our group input node, and a compare node. Let's set our compare node to not equal. Take a look at our group input. And in our group menu here, we want to change the input from geometry to integer. And let's change the name to something that makes a little bit more sense like solid. So now if we add a named attribute node, we can tell it to use the selection attribute and wire that attribute into the second input and our solid into the first input and then the result into delete geometry. So now we can see that we just have a tetrahedron because our delete geometry node is deleting everything that isn't specified by our group input. Let me just clean this up a little bit too. And now we've got all of the logic set up so that over here in our modifiers panel, we can just click through these values all the way up to four. If we go any higher than that, there's nothing because I, do, I don't have an upper limit set on this at the moment. And if we go below zero, there's nothing. But using this, we can click through all of our platonic solids. Oh, and there is one more thing I'd like to do. And that's just right here at the end after we delete our geometry what we're going to want to do is delete the attribute we created so let's drop in a remove named attribute node and hit selection and now that's it the last thing we have to do is just select everything hit Control g and that'll of course move our group input over here to the side so let's just move that back in where we want it let's just rename our group to platonic solid so we know what it is and there we go we now have a nice simple group that we can just increment through to get the different platonic solids. We have access to all of them. So yeah, that is going to do it for today. Next time we'll look at UVing because adding UVs to all of these procedural solids is not as straightforward as you would think. So we'll tackle that next time. But for now, that's going to be it. I hope you enjoyed and thanks for watching and I will see you all in the next one. Bye.